Hey friends, welcome back to another night of uh, great stuff that we're going to be talking about. Tonight's presentation, I'm glad you took some time out to join us. But before we get into it, let's just open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God in heaven, we're just so grateful and thankful that you've allowed us this time to come together and uh, search your word, Lord, uh, for the present truth. Uh, that can bring us great peace and comfort, and that's what I pray for tonight, Lord. And uh, tonight's topic is, is one that I believe uh, will help many find peace in their lives. So, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit uh, just teach us what we need to know uh, during these moments we spend together. And we give you all the praise and glory for that. In the name of your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, welcome, like I said, to tonight's presentation. As you can see on the screen, the topic for tonight, In Search of the Church. It's a great topic. Uh, in fact, it re reminds me a little bit about my journey uh, back to the Lord as well. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a little bit. So I want to bring your attention to this uh, picture that you see on the screen. It's of Lucas Cranach. Uh, in fact, Lucas Cranach was a fascinating Reformation figure, a contemporary Martin Luther. In fact, he painted the most famous portrait of Martin Luther. Another one of his most famous paintings was the Fountain of Youth. Have you ever heard of the Fountain of Youth? As far back as the 1500s, the Fountain of Youth was something people were very interested in. And then came along this man, Juan Ponce de Leon. He arrived in Florida in 1513, and he was looking for that Fountain of Youth. But alas, the Fountain of Youth has never been found, has it? Neither has the lost city of Atlantis, nor has D.B. Cooper. In 1971, the fellow who became known as D.B. Cooper he, uh, he jumped out of a plane into a freezing rainstorm at 10,000 feet with $200,000 of ransom money and a parachute. He was never seen again. Many people believe he died after that leap. But others have even claimed to have been D.B. Cooper, even though their claims have been debunked over time. No one knows what really happened to this mystery man. The lost city of Atlantis, the identity of D.B. Cooper, and the killing of former President John F. Kennedy, along with a, a lot of other uh, unsolved mysteries, uh, exist in the world we live in. You know, but by the same token, finding God's church in these last days of Earth's history is for many a mystery, an absolute mystery at that. A lot of people don't know where to turn or even know where to begin. But Jesus was clear. He has a church. And he spoke to Peter one night and he said, you are Peter. And he said, on this rock, I will build my church. You know, the truth is, Jesus is that rock. Remember, we talked about it in Daniel chapter 2, that rock that was cut out with hands. And Jesus said that he would build his church on this rock. You know, Jesus is the rock. And in the book of Revelation, he addresses the seven churches. We talked about that briefly uh, one session as Jesus walked among the lampstands, and they represented the churches throughout the history of time. And that's a great, great news for you and me tonight to know that Jesus never has ever abandoned his church. And so one thing I do want to point out is that if you are looking for a, a church right now, or if you ever, uh, that thought has crossed your mind, we need to get a few things out of the way. You will never find a quote-unquote perfect church. And I know for many that may burst their bubble, but the truth is a perfect church does not exist. It just doesn't. You know, the good news is that churches are made up with sinners like you and like me, and we are made clean by the blood of Jesus and his righteousness. So there is no quote-unquote perfect church. And if we go back to the early days of Christianity, you know, uh, Paul confronted Peter as well about some of his issues that he had to work through. And uh, you, we, we've talked about that a little bit in previous presentations too, that Peter wasn't perfect. So well, what I'm saying is when you open up the Bible, it's full of imperfect people that God used uh, to his glory. And that's what comprises our church. You know, if we're looking for a perfect church, that'll be diff difficult to find. But if you're wondering if God has a church down at the end of time, 
then you can look and you can search with real hope, when we, especially when we open up the Word of God, it reveals and testifies to us that God does. He has a church, uh, especially in these last days, that will teach the Bible and will lift up Jesus Christ. That's important. Now, Paul described that church in his letter to Timothy, and we can see the words right here. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the pillar and ground of truth. You know, we're introduced to God's church also in Revelation, and I want to look at this passage in Revelation 12, 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then it goes on to say, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Now those were uh, one thousand two hundred sixty days. Remember in Bible prophecy, those are little literal years that are being mentioned here. In Revelation chapter thirteen, uh, it kept the truth, God's word, all through that time in the, the dark period of Earth's history. The Bible was kept from people by other human beings, and the church was in the wilderness, so to speak, because uh, the, the, the word of God was literally ripped out of their hands, but God preserved his word. You know, true Christians, Bible-believing Christians, were persecuted quite frequently, and the names might sound familiar, the Waldenses, the um, Al Albigenses, and Huguenots, and others were persecuted in those days. The truth, were, uh, the truth is, is that there are terrible things that happen uh, to these people, but yet they kept the word alive. Of course, God was protecting his word uh, throughout that whole period of time, and they found some of the most unique ways to still uh, carry that word from, from one person to another. And sometimes they would even go and they would sew uh, Bible passages inside of their clothing so uh, they could pass that on to other people. It was quite fascinating when we look back at that part of history. You know, not only were millions of people put to death and persecuted for their faith uh, during this time, but the church became darkened with the teachings of man that had no basis in the Bible. We kind of went over that too in, in previous presentations. Then Bible truths were crowded out of the church by traditions and apostasy. Remember we talked about how traditions have flooded into Christianity. There were a number of false teachings that came into Christianity during these days, and we can see them. For instance, right here on the screen, infant baptism replaced baptism by immersion. And we talked about that too. Uh, transubstantiation replaced the truth of the Lord's Supper. And also you see on the screen there, uh, we, we talked about uh, the natural immortality of the soul replaced the truth of the sleep and death. Confession to a priest took the place in, of confession to God through Jesus Christ. And then we just talked about this recently as well. In the pagan day of the sun, Sunday suppl supplanted the Bible Sabbath and took its place in Christendom. Of course, it was not God's ideal, but this is what happened. And the church was in the wilderness. But God had his faithful people all through the generations of time, and God was not going to allow the church to stay in the wilderness forever. He needed to have a church that would shine his light in a dark world. He needed to have a church that would uphold his word his standards and show people the true path that God wants us to follow and demonstrates how people could know God and know his truth. In fact, he needed to, to, to uh, bring everything back into the light. Remember that term sola scriptura, the Bible alone, that's what he needed to have revealed. And he would have a body dedicated to the ideal of preparing people for his soon return, the second coming of Jesus Christ. The question is, what would this church look like? Well, let's take a peek. Revelation twelve seventeen says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus. You know, the, what we see here is the devil was angry with the woman. Now remember, we talked about this. A woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. 
So the devil was mad with the church, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now, the Bible describes the remnant uh, as being those which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You'll notice in the last days of Earth's history, the church is back. The Bible speaks about the rest of her offspring or the remnant of her seed. The remnant that which remains is that certain part of the church left over down in the end of time. The church comes back from the wilderness. The remnant describes the part which remains at the end. It's not the whole. It's a smaller, it's a smaller uh, minority of people. Jesus said these words, many are called, but few are chosen. You know, the, the sad part is that the truth will be in the minority in the end. Not everybody will want to hear the words of truth, the urgent appeal to come out of Babylon, to break away from tradition, to follow Jesus, to follow the Bible alone. Remember, we compared that to the time of Noah. Remember, he uh, pleaded with people to get in the ark. But uh, when it was all said and done with, only eight got on the ark, known as family. And uh, the truth is, the ark was built for so many more people. And Jesus said uh, that the end of the work world would be just as it was in the times of Noah. Also, we know that uh, Revelation says that at the end time, all the world wondered after or followed the beast the way in the world follows the beast, there will be people clinging to the Bible. That's good news for you and for me, uh, because I hope that you're in that group. But then the world, like I said, will go after tradition, and there will be those who will take a stand on the opposite side of truth, and they will oppose the Bible alone. The good news is that this uh, faithful group on the other side that has uh, resolved to follow Jesus to, to keep the faith of Jesus, the commandments of Jesus, and keep the, the patience, the perseverance going till the end. Uh, they won't be a perfect group because perfect people don't exist. Remember, we just talked about that. There is no such thing as a perfect church. The only one that is perfect is Jesus Christ. And the only way that we're made perfect is by His righteousness, by His atoning sacrifice and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. But, you know, we should be able to find the belief system that is founded in the Word of God when we're talking about finding a church versus a belief system that is resting on tradition. If God is going to have people in the end that will be faithful to His Word, surely, you know, you and I, we, I, I would think that we would want to be in that group. If God has a pathway of accuracy to the Scripture, a pathway of truth, of faithful, loving obedience, that's where I believe you and I want to take a stand. But the question is, how do we find it? Well, like I've told you before, the, the one place to find it, to start with, is in the Word of God, not through what other people say. It's not what I say that should convince you. It should always be you in the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you individually. Let the Scripture be our guide. The Word of God gives us identification marks so that we can know God's church and the end of time uh, when we see it, and we've talked about those identification marks throughout this, uh, this presentations or this seminar as well. I want to look at this passage, though, in Revelation twelve seventeen, It says, the remnant keep the commandments of God. Well, there's, uh, uh, there's a, a mark right there, an identif identification mark. And remember, the dragon was, was wroth with the woman, with the woman or, or the church, and went to make war with her, with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. Now that's important, because that should start binding together everything that we've been talking about throughout this whole series. Let's look at these identification marks then. God's last day church keeps the commandments of God. Of course, that's important. It should, it should be important to you. And I know it's important to me because we should be only obeying one being and that's God that's not somebody else that's not our friends or our family members or the pastor or or the priest we should only obey God and his word of course uh, does God want us to keep the 10 commandments of course he does 
But does that mean that I'm telling you that we're saved by works? No, definitely not. But we've talked about this since night one, and we made it abundantly clear, and I hope that you were there to see the first session. But the Word tells us, the Bible tells us, that we are saved by grace alone, not by our works, it's by God's grace how we're saved. You know, the truth is, is uh, obedience is never the prerequisite to salvation. Okay, that's something that we need to make abundantly clear. Obedience is not the prerequisite. Obedience is the byproduct of a loving relationship with Jesus. Of course, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, there's always a relationship first, and that stems uh, obedience. It just, it just flows. It's natural. You see, we can try to keep all the laws, just like the, the religious leaders in Jesus' time tried to do. But they didn't have a relationship with Jesus because they were so focused on their works and they thought works would, would get them to heaven and gain them that eternal inheritance. But that's not how the Bible tells us that it is. You know, another example is when we love somebody, we want to please them. And if we love our wives or our husbands, uh, you please them. And if you love your parents or your children, you love and you live to please them. See, when Jesus died for us, the response that takes place in our lives should come naturally. When we see Jesus on the cross and we remember the nails in his hands and the crown of thorns on his head, his suffering for you and for me, hanging on that old rugged cross, I don't know about you, but that draws me closer to him. And we can say things uh, such as these when we reflect on him, Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. That's the natural response. Hearts filled with love for God want to do his will. We say with David, the psalmist, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is written, thy law is within my heart. And so God has a people in the close of time who will keep the commandments of God because the relationship has been rooted in Jesus Christ. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Let's see what it says here. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. You know, this is awesome news, and this is uh, good news for that indicates that God's church, if it has a message at all, will have a gospel message to take to the whole world. You know, that's pretty cool, and that's good news for everybody. This is not an inclusive message. This is exclusive. It's to, it's to go everywhere, and there's not to be one person to be left out. It's the everlasting gospel. So here's another check mark. God's last day church preaches that everlasting gospel message to the whole world that salvation is free it's found only in jesus christ alone it's available to all christ died for my sins and your sins and like i said just a few minutes ago we are saved by god's grace through faith and salvation comes as a gift from jesus christ you know god's church must proclaim that because it's proclaiming the everlasting gospel that's the everlasting good news and that's what we're doing through this whole presentation now the question is, where in the world will God's church proclaim this everlasting gospel? Well, Revelation 14, 6 says, To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Like I just said, not to just one or two, but to every nation. That would mean that if you find a church that exists on one street, one city block, in one town, one county, one nation, one continent, it cannot possibly be the remnant of uh, the remnant church. Because the remnant church, which keeps the commandments and preaches the everlasting gospel, reaches the whole world. It will be a worldwide movement, and the gospel will go to every single nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It will go to the whole world. And go, let's go and see this. Revelation 19 says, also, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so we see here that God's last day church has the testimony of Jesus, the, the spirit of prophecy. 
But what is the gift of prophecy? You may be asking yourself that right now. Did Nostradamus have the gift of prophecy? Remember we talked about Nostradamus in one of our opening sessions? And uh, no, he didn't, because a lot of his claims came, uh, they're not true. And, and the one thing about Nostradamus is there is no hope of salvation in Nostradamus. It's all a dead-end road with Nostradamus. Did Gene Dixon have it? No. Do the tabloids and their, uh, their little messages that come out have it? Now, you know, all those things that I mentioned, a lot of people are sucked into those, and they, they absorb all that uh, stuff up, whether they see it in the tabloids or they come across shows that talk about uh, just different, you know, prophets or so-claimed prophets that have lived throughout the ages. But we're going to talk about uh, this testimony of Jesus. What is this gift of prophecy, and how can we identify what a true prophet looks like? You know, the, the truth is we just can't, uh, be, we can't be a prophet just because we say we are. There has to be identification marks like we're talking about through this whole uh, presentation. You know, how do we know that somebody's a prophet? Well, let's not just talk about it. Let's look at the world. And, I mean, I'm sorry, let's look at the Word and see what the Word has to say about how we can identify a prophet. You know, the truth is some people may say, well, you know, we don't need any more prophets. Uh, they all existed in the Bible. And so people may get freaked out or scared if they see that a church has a, a prophet or prophetess uh, within their history. But the truth is right here that, that God says right here in 1 Corinthians twelve twenty eight has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, uh, helps, administrations, a variety of tongues. And just as uh, God gives other spiritual gifts, he has gifted the church with the gift of prophecy. And it is up to us to identify uh, the genuine and not to be sucked into the, uh, the, to the counterfeit. And uh, here are some points that I want us to take away tonight. Jeremiah 28.9 made it clear that the gift of prophecy would be accurate. That's the first thing that we need to point out. Prophecy is always accurate. Now, not all prophecy is predictive. But if Daniel had said that there would be four medals, remember that statue, and then the feet and toes, but there were actually six great world-ruling nations before the, the feet and the toes, we would say Daniel was wrong. Now, if he had said seven beasts, then the beast with ten horns, but in fact there were four nations in Daniel 7, we would say Daniel was wrong. But he made a prediction looking far off into the future, and we know that Daniel was absolutely right. And so one of the identifying marks is, is uh, the accuracy of, of proph prophecy. Also, we see it's in harmony with the Bible. De Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3 makes that perfectly clear, that someone that has the gift of prophecy must be in harmony with the Bible. And in other words, if, if the prophet says one thing and the word says another, we call, what do you call that? That's, uh, that's a contradiction. And that is not uh, what the Bible teaches. So a true prophet will never contradict the word, but it will harmonize uh, the word. Also, a true prophet will only seek to exalt Jesus. So many prophets are false prophets. They seek uh, self-exaltation. So a lot of these prophets and a lot of these pastors uh, that say that they're prophets, they're really just drawing people to them to glorify themselves. But that's not what the Bible teaches. A true prophet seeks only to glorify and exalt Jesus. And then a true prophet upholds God's law. And uh, how do we know that? Well, because it says this in Isaiah 8.20. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, did it say there is some or maybe uh, a fraction of light? No, if, if they do not speak to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to that word, it is because there is no light in them. Do not buy in to, to those that, that speak those words if it's not to the law and to the testimony. But what if somebody is saying, you can live in disobedience to the Ten Commandments and it doesn't matter a bit to God? Well, that's wrong because Jesus said, 
if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And then we read in Revelation 22, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. You know, the, the Bible also says in 1 John that his commandments are not grievous. Clearly the Lord wants us to obey him because we have that loving relationship with him. You know, the truth is, is when God calls us out of darkness, wherever we are walking in, in darkness, uh, if we obey him, then he, that's our step of faith. And then we can use that as, as a good um, marker to say God is trustworthy. And that's what God is trying to do. He's trying to establish himself in, in my life, in your life, to be a trustworthy God. Of course, he always has been trustworthy. He never fails us. You know, somebody that claims to be speaking on behalf of God would certainly or definitely not be speaking against God's law. And so the last point here is that the gift of prophecy would be found in the church. It's not the gift of prophecy when it's, you know, on a late night talk show and in the tabloids. The genuine gift of prophecy is a spiritual gift given by God for the edifying or the blessing of the church. And we need to keep in mind why God even gives us the gift of prophecy. And we go back to the time of the flood, before the flood. Remember God raised up Noah and gave him the gift of prophecy? Why? Well, he wanted people to be ready for the flood, the, the flood ready for the danger that was to come. You know, it, it would be uh, troublesome if we served a God that didn't care enough about us, that he wouldn't give us uh, warnings and uh, all the, the ample uh, you know, things that we need to be prepared and to be ready. That's why he gave us prophecy. You know, some people might say, though, well, why doesn't God give us the specific details of every little thing so we can know what's coming and, and uh, we can be even more prepared? Well, the truth is, is, you know, there's a danger in, in knowing too much because if we, if we know everything, then why would we need God? We would just learn to, to trust ourselves and not rely on God. So that's why God has given us just enough that we need to know. And the rest, we just have to lean back and trust God. Because everything that he's given us through his prophets have come true. And that's, that's just telling us that God can be trusted. He's trustworthy. And he has our best interest in mind. You know, let's fast forward a little bit and uh, through the Bible. And let's go to John of the Baptist. Uh, and, and it says, it reminds me that God wanted the people of, of Jesus' day to be ready too. For when the Messiah come, remember? John the Baptist laid the way for Jesus. Well, the same thing for Jesus' second coming. He has given us a prophecy to lay the way and to prepare people for his second coming because he doesn't want people to miss it. You know, the truth is, is that many people missed uh, Jesus when he came and walked on this earth, even though they had people like John the Baptist preparing the way. They, they couldn't comprehend uh, what was truly going on, and they were missing the signs. And Jesus doesn't want us to miss the signs a second time. He wants everybody to be informed. You know, Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. And God said to his remnant in his last days would have the gift of prophecy also working in its midst. So here's a question. How did God place the gift of prophecy in the remnant? Keeping the commandments of God. Well, let's go back and let's look at history. I want to take you back to the 1800s. I want to draw your attention to this uh, picture on the screen. This is of a minister named William Miller. He was a Baptist minister at the time. And he was studying the prophecies of the Bible and came to the conclusion that Jesus was returning in 1843. Well, Jesus didn't return during that year. And they came to the conclusion that they were off and, and they had calculated the prophecy wrong and that Jesus was to return in 1844. Yet you and I both know that didn't happen. And even though William Miller was a godly man, he was wrong in his calculations. But here's the thing that happened out of all of that. It got many people to think about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this, is, this was the first time in a long time that the church had been really focused on that idea that Christ was coming back. You know, through it all, God placed his hand on the heart of a 17-year-old woman 
during that time and gave her a very special gift, the gift of prophecy. And through this young lady, God shared great wisdom with the church and with the word, with the world for more than 70 years. And today, there are more than 100 books that were written that have been compiled from the writings of this lady. And there has been no other female author in the history of literature trans that translated uh, more languages, well, that this literature has been translated into more languages than this woman who had a, a very minimal education but was endowed by a great blessing and measure of the Holy Spirit. What she shared with others about Christ was uh, and his word has changed lives all around the world. Of course, all of this is uh, the doing of God and not herself. The church that she helped to found, to establish, is in more countries on the planet than any other Protestant church in the world. Her book, Step to Christ, is the best book outside of the Bible that I know that has helped reach and convert many people to Christ and help their relationship with God uh, just uh, be enriched in a deeper and more meaningful way. You know, the truth is, uh, Ellen, Ellen White has written a, a lot of good counsel on dietary and, and health uh, messages that have uh, stood the test of time, and people even to this day applaud the writings that was led by the Holy Spirit. In fact, uh, uh, one nutritionist from Cornell University, Dr. Clive McKay said these words, Whatever may be the religious beliefs of a reader, he or she cannot help but gain much guidance in a better and healthier way of life from reading the major works of Ellen G. White. Even modern nutritionists uh, whose life is dedicated to human welfare must be impressed by the, the writings and leadership of Ellen White. Her ministry help has helped thousands of people all around the planet establish a relationship with Jesus that has grown their faith in him and also in the word of God. And that's what the gift of prophecy is supposed to do. Of course, uh, Ellen, Ellen White has, does not put her writing on the same level as the Bible, and she even comes out and says that. Uh, she wrote in a time where people were struggling uh, to stay focused in the word. So all of her writing was to help them uh, establish a better relationship with Christ, but she always pointed towards the Bible as the authority. Her writing was never on the same level. And that's, she makes it very clear about that as well. In fact, the Bible is supposed to be the sole, sole rule of faith and practice. But the gift of prophecy was blessed by God to point us towards the Bible and to point us to Jesus. Uh, in fact, uh, we can say even in this, this day that we live in, people still struggle to open the Bible. So that's why her writings are, are still uh, valid for us today. So let's take, just take a look at these things here. So God's last day church keeps the commandments, preaches the everlasting gospel, reaches the world, has the gift of prophecy. In Revelation 18, 1 through 3 says, And after these I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated, and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And then we go on and see these words. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. So there we see also that the God's last day church will preach an appeal for the people to come out of Babylon. And remember we talked about that in previous presentations, is that there's a, a false, uh, there's, there's the false teaching set up, there's a counterfeit to God's truth. And uh, just like in Nebuchadnezzar's day, remember that, that place that he lived in, Babylon, uh, we are called to, to, to come out of that if we're living in that. And we're called to come out because we need to give God everything that we have. We need to give him all of our worship and praise that is undefiled. And so we come out of that false worship. Remember, 
in Babylon, that's where they bowed down to that, that huge idol, that false worship, and they were bowing down to man-made things, to tradition. And so we're called to come out of that. And that's what last, God's last day church will do as well. They'll call people to come out of Babylon. Now, somebody might be asking, does that mean that what you're saying is only people who go to church are Christians and, uh, and only people in your church can be saved? Of course not. That's not what we're saying. Uh, but what I can tell you is God wants to guide us in spirit and truth. In fact, that's biblical. But the path of the just is like the, sh- the shining sun that shines ever brighter until the perfect day. You know, when we look back in history, we just go back and we see this statue right here. It reminds me uh, of when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the, to the castle door in the Church of Wittenberg. In fact, this is a statue of Martin Luther holding those uh, theses um, or holding, that, you know, holding a book uh, in his hand. Now, the, the truth is he didn't want to leave the church that he was in. He loved his church, and he had hoped that his church would reform. And that's why he wrote those 95 theses. And he, he, he wished that they would embrace the Bible truths. However, the church did not. Luther was separated from the church, and his followers who followed him became Lutherans. But unfortunately, that's where they stopped. In the, that's where they stopped in the word, and they didn't press on. And the same thing can be said about Calvinists. They followed Calvin because Calvin added a little bit more light, but then they stopped where Calvin stopped. The same thing happened with Zwingli. Zwingli added a little bit more light, then his followers stopped where he stopped. The same thing can be said about John Wesley. And the Anabaptists brought, some, uh, brought baptism by immersion, and then John Wesley taught about the new birth. Then William Miller alerted the world to the fact that we, that we just talked about a few minutes ago, that Jesus was coming back again. And for the first time in a long time, people were focused on the second coming. And out of William Miller's movement came uh, a group of people that became known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And of course, I'm not here to tell you that this church is the perfect church. Uh, church. Remember, I said from the very beginning, there is no such thing as a perfect church. In fact, uh, we're, we're, none of us are perfect. We're all sinners. But it stands on the Bible, on the Bible alone. And as we compare the Bible to the teachings of the churches all across the Christian landscape, we can see that God does have a church, uh, teaching as close to the truth as can be found to the Word of God why? Because it's standing on the foundation of the Word. And it stands on the foundation laid of other great men and women of God that have come before him. You know, when the pilgrims are about to leave the Netherlands to come to the New World, their pastors stayed behind. Pastor John Robinson said to them as they knelt together on the sand beside the ocean these words, I charge you before God that you follow me no f- farther than you have seen me follow Christ. For I am very, very, verily persuaded the Lord hath more truth and light yet to break forth from his holy word. Did you, did you notice that? I believe God still has more light. And that's exactly what he was referring to. And that's because there was more light to follow. In fact, John 10, 16 uh, reminds us that there is still more light ahead of us that we still have to learn through God's word. It says in, in, right here, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And we talked about that in a previous presentation as well. Is when God calls uh, his people out of Babylon. Remember he said, I, it's God's people that are living in Babylon will be called out by the truth. What I'm asking tonight to whoever is watching is that if God is, is knocking on your heart, if some of these words that were said tonight has impacted you in any way, is take that between you and the Lord and take that to the Word and pray over that and let God be your resolve. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Remember, though, that Revelation tells us that there's a, a scarlet woman who is deceiving many people with a counterfeit to God's truth. 
It's always been over worship. Remember, that's how it started in heaven. Satan desired to have worship. And uh, he desires the same thing on this planet, to take people away from, their, from true worship to God. You know, I want to submit to you tonight that if you're watching this episode or the previous episodes and you've been drawn to these videos, it's not by uh, just mere chance or coincidence. No, I believe it full heartedly because God has been drawing you all along. And uh, he isn't calling you and asking you just to stay put. No, when we're drawn to his words because God is trying to reveal more truth to us. And then he is asking for us to take that step of faith, that leap forward and trust him, advancing in the light of the truth. You know, the fact is, is that before I came back to church, I searched and searched and searched for the right church as well. And I went to about 14 different uh, denominations looking for uh, the truth. And although that the, I did find churches with many, many loving people in those churches, I did not find uh, the complete truth that I find in this church, a, a church that, that is, has a, a prophetic gift, a church that preaches the end time message and puts all of their faith and trust in Jesus alone. And that's what I'm appealing to you tonight, is as you search through the scriptures, you look at the words uh, that are, are, are found in them, it, it just go through the check boxes that we went through this session and check tonight. And I believe that God will open up your eyes and guide you to, to the right church. And I want to give you the opportunity today to tell Jesus also that you're ready to, uh, to follow him because of everything that he has revealed and done in your life, you know, the, the fact is, is that he died and he rose for you and for me, and he went back to heaven. And he's coming back again. He's coming back sooner than you are, and I even know. I believe he's coming back very, very soon. And I don't want you to miss it. And I don't want you to be uh, what, the re re what Revelation tells us is uh, being on the wrong side of the tracks in that place called Babylon. I want you to be standing on the right side for God. And I believe if you, uh, if you read the words and you listen to the words being spoken to you through his spirit, you will be on the right side as well. So I just want to close with a word of prayer and uh, just invite you uh, to join me as well. Heavenly Father, God, I praise and thank you for being a God that never abandons us. And Lord, you keep revealing more truth to us as we um, are willing to go into a deeper relationship with you as well. And I just praise you for that. Now, Lord, I just pray over this message, Lord. I, I pray for those who receive it, Lord. And I just ask that uh, those who re received it find it uh, with, with, uh, with comfort and peace that can only be found through your spirit, God. And uh, Lord, just keep drawing us all closer to you is my prayer. And I thank you once again for, for being here with us. And uh, we just pray everything now in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, I just want to thank you all for joining us during this, uh, this series that we have put on here. I know it's not a, a perfect production. We are, uh, you know, learning as we go a lot of things here. But we, uh, we really appreciate your patience and your willingness to tune in and to, to listen. Of course, none of this is about us. It's about uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why we're putting this on. It's really all about Jesus and to reveal his loving character uh, to each one of us. And I hope that you found it rewarding, and I hope that it strengthened your walk with the Lord. And for those who uh, never had a relationship with Jesus, I hope it, it was a series that initiated that spark that will be, will be the beginning of the greatest and most rewarding relationship you will ever find uh, in this lifetime, which is through Jesus Christ. Well, I just want to end by um, thanking you guys once again. And uh, if we don't see each other on this side of heaven, I hope that we will be able to see each other on the, neck, on the other side and come up and say, hey, I, I saw your name pop up as one of the viewers, and I can come up and give you a hug, get, you give me a hug. But anyways... I just urge you guys to keep pressing on to the finish line and uh, keep our eyes uh, to heaven 
And uh, we just can't wait till that glorious day we can be together with our Lord and Savior and all of our loved ones again. Until we meet again, may God keep you and bless you and uh, take care. And we'll hopefully see each other soon. God bless.